This video reviews the procedures for how to conduct a Score the Shore assessment for the Cooperative Lakes Monitoring Program. The end result of the Score the Shore assessment will be a series of numbers that quantify the overall lakeshore habitat quality of a lake. The Cooperative Lakes Monitoring Program, or CLMP, is a program of the Michigan Department of Environmental Quality and is supported by numerous partners. About 230 Michigan Inland Lakes participate in the CLMP every year. The CLMP is part of the Michigan Clean Water Corps, also called MICOR. If you have questions about MICOR or the CLMP, you can contact Paul Steen at the email shown. Much of the basic information about how the CLMP works is covered in our Secchi Disk Transparency video and our Total Phosphorus video. All of that basic information applies to the Score the Shore assessment as well. To learn more about any of the topics listed here, please watch either of those videos and visit the MyCore website. Shorelines are an important component of every lake. They are the primary habitat area for most of a lake's animals. Birds, amphibians, reptiles, insects, and fish all rely on the shallow water and the aquatic and terrestrial vegetation along the edge to find food and a safe place to rear their young. Healthy shorelines help maintain water quality, limit erosion, and slow rain runoff. However, shorelines are threatened on most lakes where people live and recreate. Houses and everything associated with them often eliminate the important components of a healthy shoreline. Lawns, rocks, and seawalls remove optimal habitat locations. Foot traffic, docks, and the desire for an unobstructed view of the lake remove vegetation that stops erosion. The Score the Shore assessment is a standardized method that aids lake residents in finding problematic habitat areas on their lakes. To do this, a team of three to four people will troll around the edge of the lake and judge the health of the shoreline using a scoring form. The shoreline is broken into 1,000 foot sections that are scored individually. The first step in the Score the Shore process is to break your shoreline into the approximately 1,000 foot sections. The sections don't have to be exactly 1,000 feet, just close to it. You need to do this before you begin the survey. We recommend using an aerial map to first produce a rough sketch of where the 1,000 foot sections will fall. Then cruise around the lake in your boat and pinpoint specific landmarks like a house or a dock that indicate the exact start and stop of each section. The second step is to print the data sheets. You only need one copy of the survey cover sheet, but you will need many copies of the survey data form. Each 1,000 foot section will require several of these data forms, depending on how many people make up your team. They are available at the website shown. The third step is to gather your equipment. Here is a list of what is needed or suggested for the assessment. Most of the use of this equipment is self-evident. One thing to highlight is the tally counter or clicker. You will use these to count houses, docks, and woody debris, and it'll be a big time saver. To properly assess the lake, it needs to have plants or vegetative growth. Therefore, it is recommended to wait until at least mid-June before starting and finish before mid-September. Otherwise, the exact timing of when to conduct the assessment is up to you. The size of your lake will determine how long it will take to finish the assessment. On a small lake, the assessment may only take a couple of hours, but it could take several days on a large lake. Plan on each 1,000 foot section taking at least 30 minutes. As your team gets better at its job, this number will go down. Finally, you should repeat this survey occasionally. We recommend doing the survey every three to five years on your lake. Based on our experience working with teams and volunteers on the water, you'll find in the Score the Shore procedures that we include a recommended process for your team to follow while scoring the shoreline sections. This process tends to work efficiently for teams. It follows the sequence of items on the scoring form and allows you to get a good view of the shoreline features you need to assess. You may find a different process that works well for your team on your lake. Let's review this general recommended process now. An efficient Score the Shore team should consist of at least three people. One person whose primary responsibility is driving the boat 
and two others focused on assessing the shoreline features. Navigate to your chosen starting point at the beginning of your first 1,000 foot shoreline section. Plan to make at least three passes back and forth in your boat along this 1,000 foot section. For the first pass, position the boat about 100 yards offshore. This will allow you a view where you can see most of the 1,000 foot section at once. You'll then make a second pass closer to shore, about 20 to 30 feet out. The final pass will be back out at about 100 yards from the shore. Every team member, except potentially the driver, should be provided with a stack of scoring forms, one for each 1,000 foot section, and will record answers to the questions. The driver can idle the boat while the team discusses answers to the various questions and reaches agreement. One person should record the final answers. This is the survey cover sheet. It includes general information about the survey. Record the lake name, county, and townships, as well as the lake sampling site, or field ID, number. Record the names of all the team members and the date of the survey. It's okay to conduct the survey over multiple days, just record all the dates on this cover sheet. Lake level at the time of the survey can influence some of your observations. Indicate whether the lake level during the survey was average or normal, low or high. Some lakes have a legally mandated lake level that is managed by a dam. If your lake has a legal lake level, check yes on the cover sheet and indicate the measurement at the level gauge near the outlet at the time of the survey if possible. There is also space for you to comment on whether the lake level impacted the survey results. For example, if the water level is quite high during the survey, it may make it difficult to see certain shoreline features because they may be underwater. If possible, the survey should be conducted during normal lake level conditions. The bottom half of the survey cover sheet should be filled in when your survey is complete. Here you will record the total number of 1,000 foot shoreline sections that were surveyed on your lake. If the final section surveyed was substantially shorter than 1,000 feet, you can record the approximate length here. Note whether photographs were taken as part of the survey. Photos can be really helpful for comparing conditions over time and can help you look back and answer questions you may have about the survey. However, photographs are not required. Calculate the development density and overall shore score for your lake by following the instructions in the box. Development density around a lake and the overall shore score are often related. Now let's take a look at the scoring form itself. Your report will include one of these scoring forms for each 1,000 foot section on your lake. At the top of the form, record the section number. This is very important. Also record the lake name, county, and date. While recording the lake name on every sheet may seem redundant, it's critical to include this information on every form for statewide record keeping. Then record GPS coordinates or a landmark that indicates the starting point for this 1,000 foot shoreline section. Refrain from using people's full names, for example, John Smith's house, on the scoring forms, out of considerations for your neighbor's privacy. Copies of these forms will be stored by the MyCorps program forever. The scoring form is laid out with the expectation that your team will follow the three pass process we outlined earlier. Recall that you don't have to do the survey this way, but many teams have found that it works well. First, we'll review this entire scoring form. Next, we'll look at photographs and examples of the types of things you might see along the shoreline of your lake and examples of how to fill out this form. But first, back to the form. For pass one, you should keep your boat about 100 yards from shore. Cruise along the shoreline and count the number of homes and major buildings and the number of docks and boat lifts. When you reach the end of pass one, make sure that everyone on the team agrees where this shoreline section ends. Next, head back in the opposite direction, closer to shore for pass two. You should be 20 to 30 yards out, so you can see the shoreline features well. You'll be looking at the littoral zone features and shoreline erosion. The littoral zone is the underwater area close to shore. The handy diagram in the upper right corner of the sheet will help you remember this. First question, what percentage of the 1000 foot section exhibits emergent or floating vegetation? Emergent vegetation are aquatic plants that stick up out of the water. This would include reeds and pickerel weed. Floating vegetation typically is water lilies. Your options include none, 
less than 10% of the total 1,000 foot section, 10 to 25%, 25 to 75%, or more than 75%. Notice that after each choice is a number in parentheses. This is the number of points the section earns for each option. No need to worry about those points now. You'll add them up later, back on shore. The next question asks you to estimate how much of the shoreline exhibits submerged vegetation. Those would be underwater plants, like coontail and milfoil. If the water isn't clear enough for you to make this estimate, simply check unable to see. The next question asks you if aquatic plant management is evident or known. That is, can you see or do you know that plants have been sprayed, harvested, or otherwise removed along this 1,000 foot section? If not, choose no. Otherwise, select minor if there's some weed management around docks and swim areas, or major if practically all the plant life in the lake near shore has been treated or removed. Next, estimate the amount of downed trees or other woody debris, like branches or logs, along this 1,000 foot section. Your choices are none, a few, that is one to five trees or branches, several or many. Your last observation during this second pass close to shore is to estimate how much erosion you observe along this 1,000 foot section. None, minor, moderate, or severe. We recognize this is a judgment call on your part, but that's what we're looking for, your team's opinion about the extent of erosion in this section. For pass three, take the boat back out to about 100 yards from shore for the final observations. First, estimate the percentage of maintained lawn, beach, and impervious surface along the 1,000 foot section. Don't count naturally sandy shoreline as maintained beach. Impervious surface refers to areas where rainwater can't soak in, pavement or pavers without space between them. What percentage of the 1,000 foot section is unmowed vegetation? That's vegetation other than lawn, such as brush, trees, or weedy overgrowth. Next, about how deep does that unmowed vegetation extend back from the water's edge? Less than 10 feet? 10 to 40 feet back from shore? More? The final section refers to erosion control practices that you see along the shoreline. Are people doing things to stop erosion? The categories include vertical artificial, which includes any kind of vertical structure that people have installed, including metal seawalls or rock walls. Sloped artificial includes sloped structures or materials placed on the shoreline. Common examples include concrete or rocks. Finally, is there any bioengineering evident? This includes use of natural materials to stop erosion, like bundles of branches or core logs, which are long bundles of coconut fibers. Once your team has answered these questions, it is time to record the GPS coordinates or landmark at the end of the section. Again, don't take time to add up scores now. That can be done when you're back on shore. On the back of each section's data sheet, you'll find space for scoring and comments. This math scales all of your scores to a 0 to 100 point range to aid in their interpretation. Many lakes may be turbid enough or have bad lighting conditions, so you can't see the submerged vegetation. If that is the case for your lake, use the alternative equation shown. This equation takes submerged vegetation out of the final score altogether. If you have comments or concerns about this section of shoreline or about the survey itself, you can include them in the space provided here. Beginning back at the top of the data form, we'll now look at photographic examples of each feature you'll be looking for. Remember, the assessment is done on 1,000 foot sections as a whole, not lot by lot. You'll see that most of the upcoming photos show single lots, but that's just for illustration purposes. We recommend beginning pass one about 100 yards from shore to count homes and major buildings and docks. During this pass, you can also make sure that everyone on the survey team agrees where the section begins and ends. When you count the number of docks and boat lifts in your 1,000 foot section, a dock with an attached boat lift, like this one, just counts as one. Now, make a second pass along the section closer to shore, as conditions allow for safe navigation. This may be about 20 to 30 yards from shore. 
This photograph shows emergent and floating vegetation. The reeds closer to the shoreline are emergent plants. They grow up out of the water. The water lilies in the foreground are floating vegetation. Here's another example of a littoral area in the lake that has both floating and emergent vegetation. This photo shows floating algae on the surface of a lake. This floating algae can be counted as floating vegetation. Here's an example of submerged vegetation. Submerged vegetation may come close to the surface. Small flowers or other reproductive structures may break the surface, but the rest is underwater and counts as submerged vegetation. Submerged vegetation may also be far beneath the surface, growing low against the lake bottom. Now, let's look at evidence of aquatic plant management. A single bubbler like this is minor aquatic plant management. The constant disturbance by bubbles prevents floating plants and other vegetation from taking root in a small area. Mechanical harvesting across an entire section or much of it would be considered major management activity. Weed roller use in a few places along a section could be considered minor, but if everyone's doing it, leading to nearly continuous removal of aquatic vegetation, then you can call it major. What should you count as downed trees and woody debris? Partially or fully submerged wood counts. If the lake is unusually low during the survey, feel free to count wood that is currently exposed but would normally be at least partially submerged. Concentrate your counting on pieces three inches or larger in diameter. Don't worry about counting the twigs. This fallen tree is only partially in the water, but it counts if it's in the water at all. Wood near the lake shore can provide valuable cover for fish and other wildlife. Here's another example of wood in the water. These are definitely big enough to count. Here's another interesting example. Some wood you encounter may have been placed on purpose to control erosion. If that's the case, you can count it here, but we'll also be able to consider it when you're assessing erosion control later on in the data form. Now, let's look at evidence of erosion. This is an example of a small area of erosion. Include erosion that is clearly the result of human activity, as well as erosion that may be caused by forces of nature, like wind, waves, or ice. This situation is commonly seen. There is erosion all along this stretch of lakeshore. It's probably not severe, that is, the hillside isn't about to fall in, but likely moderate since it is happening along a long stretch and it appears that the property owner is trying to stop it by placing some rocks along the shore. Here is another example of moderate erosion. The tree isn't falling into the lake yet and erosion is likely slow and gradual. However, if you are familiar with this property and happen to know that in the spring there was no erosion at all, you would be justified in calling this severe erosion because you know it's happening rapidly. Here's another example of moderate erosion. The sloped lawn shows clear evidence of erosion, likely because they are trying to maintain lawn on a steep slope, but there are no major cave-ins or slumps. This hill slope is actively eroding. For this small stretch, erosion seems severe. This property seems to have no vegetation on the slope and has the potential for serious erosion. Consider approaching nearer to take a closer look. Is there evidence of active erosion? Should a beach area be counted as erosion? Only if there are active signs of the sand being lost to the lake. If your lake is naturally sandy, sand beaches may be a natural feature and should not be counted as erosion. Now, let's head back out further from shore, like 100 yards out, for our final pass. You'll now assess the riparian zone, that land near the shore, and erosion control practices. Maintained lawn refers to turf grass or other vegetation that is regularly mowed for use or appearance as lawn. In this example, we see maintained lawn as well as a small impervious walkway. Remember, impervious means water cannot penetrate. For this assessment, you will judge the percentage of the section length that is lawn, artificial beach, and impervious all together. 
Here's an interesting example where you can clearly see maintained lawn and a parking lot, which is impervious surface along the shoreline. This patio is another example of impervious surface. The gravel and mulch around it is not impervious. Water can soak through, but the pavers create a section of impervious surface. This patio is entirely impervious. This lot exhibits maintained lawn and an artificial beach. We know it is an artificial beach because the shoreline of this lake is not naturally sandy. The sand is likely brought in by the homeowner for a small swimming area. This lot includes an artificial beach and artificial erosion control. Now we're looking at some good stuff, unmowed vegetation. Look at two characteristics. First, what percentage of the 1,000 foot section has unmowed vegetation? And that can include any vegetation, tall grasses, wildflowers, weeds, shrubs, and trees. Second, on average, how deep is that belt of unmowed vegetation? That is, how far does it stretch back from the water's edge? This one appears to stretch back less than 10 feet. There appears to be some rock that has been placed at the base of this unmowed vegetation belt. That's okay, we can comment on that under the shoreline erosion control practices section. This vegetation should still be counted under unmowed vegetation. Here's another unmowed vegetation belt. It's not very deep, but it's there. This lot includes gravel, rock, and beds of unmowed vegetation. You can consider the entire lot to have a belt of unmowed vegetation, even though there is some exposed gravel. The depth of the unmowed vegetation belt on this lot is fairly deep. It appears to be more than 10 feet, but probably less than 40 feet. This lot is heavily wooded. If vegetation is growing densely enough that you can't see through it, you can safely say that it is greater than 40 foot deep. This section of shoreline exhibits a couple of different depths of unmowed vegetation. On your left hand side, the unmowed vegetation starts as shrubby growth along the shoreline and becomes forest further back. It's definitely more than 40 feet deep. On your right hand side, there's just a narrow strip of unmowed vegetation behind the dock before the lawn. This is easily less than 10 feet. Now let's look at some shoreline erosion control practices, starting with artificial erosion control like steel and rock. Vertical artificial practices include structures like metal seawalls, vertical boulders, and rock walls. This picture shows a vertical seawall. Here is another example of a long metal seawall. This vertical seawall is made from concrete. Large boulders and vertical walls of rock are also considered vertical artificial structures. Here we have a vertical boulder wall in front of a concrete seawall. Structure like this one should also be considered vertical. Even though there is some slope to the boulders in front of the seawall, it doesn't pass what we call the turtle test. We like to reference the turtle test for determining whether erosion control structure is vertical or sloped. If a turtle in the lake has no chance of making it up onto dry land, it's probably vertical. What do you think of this type of erosion control? Even though it's fairly low, it still should be considered vertical. Think of that little turtle. Now, let's look at some examples of sloped artificial erosion control practices. This can include concrete in smooth or broken pieces and riprap or smaller rocks. A turtle might struggle here too, but at least it has a chance when it comes to sloped artificial control practices. Here's an example of extensive sloped artificial erosion control created from concrete block. Sloped riprap is quite common along many lake shorelines. It passes the turtle test. Here you can see a lot lined with sloped rock. Their neighbor has installed a vertical steel seawall. Even a small amount of rock or riprap should be considered when you estimate the overall percentage of sloped artificial erosion control in the 1,000 foot section you are working on. And be sure to count it even if there is unmowed vegetation growing on top of it or behind it. 
Is this an example of sloped or vertical artificial erosion control? At the foot of the slope, where it reaches the water, it is sloped rock or riprap. There are vertical rock walls that create terraces upland of the riprap. Try the turtle test. The turtle should be able to make it to dry land. Call it sloped. Even though there are rocks or riprap piled up against the seawall in this example, it should be counted as vertical seawall. What about this example? In this case, you may be able to count it as sloped. At least in the more distant part of this picture, our turtle may be able to make the transition. Remember, just use your best judgment on these categories. Work with your team to agree upon how to record what you observe. Finally, let's look at some examples of bioengineering or soft engineering erosion control. What you see here are core logs, long bundles of coconut or other natural fibers designed to stop erosion. Note that while these areas don't get a positive score on the data form, like a natural shoreline would, the score is less negative than artificial structures because although erosion is being managed, it is being dealt with in a way that eventually, with proper maintenance, will be indistinguishable from natural shoreline. The shoreline will be recovered at that point. On a related note, if you know of an area where bioengineering was installed years ago and now most people wouldn't be able to tell that it ever happened, that is, it looks natural now, then that shoreline area should be considered natural and not included in your percentage of shoreline with evident bioengineering. Here's a closer look at core logs in action. Note the vegetation planted between the logs. The roots of those plants will eventually take over the job of erosion control. Core logs are sometimes installed along great lengths of shoreline. Stumps and bundles of brush or branches are also used for bioengineered erosion control. Remember this picture from the woody debris section? You can also include this stretch in your assessment of the extent of bioengineering erosion control in this section. What about stuff like this? You can definitely see some artificial erosion control going on here, and it looks like it would pass the turtle test. We'll call it sloped artificial. One more example. What do you see here? From this angle, it looks like our turtle would have a tough time making it over this wood material. If that's the case, it doesn't pass the turtle test, and you can call it vertical artificial. Now for some last bits of advice. Photographs can be immensely useful for documenting your observations. Here are some helpful rules for ensuring that your photos will be useful for you. First, take lots of pictures. Discard any that are blurry or out of focus. And be sure to incorporate a method for recording the location where each photo was taken. This can be done in a number of ways, such as recording the photo number on your data sheet for that section, or taking a picture of the section number, perhaps written on a piece of paper or dry erase board before you begin photographing that section of shoreline. Your Score the Shore report should be submitted to my core by the October 30 annual deadline. The Score the Shore procedures include the details of where to send your complete report, which should include a completed survey cover sheet, a set of all data forms, there should be one for each 1,000 foot section on your lake, a map of your lake showing the locations of each section, and finally, any photographs you'd like to submit. Be sure to make a copy for your records before submitting your report to my core. So what good is all this information anyway? The results from this survey are not regulatory and not intended to be as enforcement for what people can or can't do on their property. However, the assessment is a valuable educational tool. You can share your results with neighbors and give tips on how lake residents can help improve scores. We recommend newsletter articles, talks at neighborhood and association meetings, and friendly conversations. It's also valuable if you're able to repeat the survey. You may see areas where your lake has improved or gotten worse over time. Thanks for watching. We hope that this video accomplished our goal of instructing you on how to conduct a Score the Shore assessment in the Cooperative Lakes Monitoring Program.